Hi, I'm Hilary Victoria and welcome back to my crime and policing channel. In today's session, we are continuing our investigations through forensic psychology. And in particular, we like to focus on British criminals. And that's just because we're going to go through Britain, then I might even head over to the States or Australia. Who knows, right? But Britain's got a bevy of bad eggs that we can choose from. We've covered Peter Sutcliffe, we've covered Dennis Nielsen, we've covered the Black Panther and we've applied forensic psychological processes to all of those. In today's video, however, we've got a bit of a unique one and that's because in order to investigate one, we need to investigate the other. We are looking at Fred and Rose West. Now, Fred and Rose West are a notorious couple in the UK. So if you're watching from a different country, you might think, who are they? Well, Fred and Rose West, they terrorised the United Kingdom for 20 years before they were caught and the crimes they committed were astronomically explicit, disgusting crimes. And we're going to dig into that and see if we know why or see if we've got some indicators earlier on that could have prevented these acts from happening. So this savage double act were kind of a match made in, in hell. You know, you see you've got a match made in heaven. These guys were not good together. In fact, they were murderous. So Fred and Rose West, if you've not heard of them before, hopefully you uh, will watch this video, do a little bit of research as well. I mean, I've watched so much stuff about this and read so many different things because it fascinates me. Like I've said before, I don't think serial killers are cool. You're never gonna get any glamorization from me, okay? What we are gonna get, however, is the thinking behind stuff, the looking at the evidence, looking at the people, and trying to figure out what makes this person turn to crime. We're going to start with Fred. So we'll look at Fred West, we'll look at Rose, and then we'll see what happened when they forged this horrendous bond. Frederick Walter Stephen West was born in 1941 in the September. I don't know why the date is interesting. It might be, I don't know. So he was born in September 1941, and he was one of a number of children, about six kids, uh, who survived. I think they had more than that, but the only six who actually survived past um, infancy. So he was the eldest of these kids. He was quite an unremarkable man. So we talked about Dennis Nilsson before and um, Peter Sutcliffe and how they were also quite unremarkable. They weren't, you know, they were no Brad Pitts, put it that way. So Fred West was born into a, a large family. There were farmers that lived and worked on a farm. His family weren't just farmers though. They were really, really, really unconventional. And not just in like a quirky way, in like a really messed up way. We're talking incest and all sorts here. So Fred claimed by the age of 12, not only had he been sexually assaulted by his parents, he'd also been encouraged to perform these acts on animals. So we're looking right at section 69 here of the Sexual Offences Act. Um, yes, so not only has a child has he been introduced to graphic sex from his parents but also towards animals so if we start looking at things in terms of indicators that people are susceptible to turn to violent crime things like hurting animals is one of them things like um, abuse as a child is, is also another one of those indicators and Fred bless him has both at school Fred was deemed by his peers to be quite slow these are the words that I read from quotes by the way I'm not saying this myself it was quite slow that he was dim, is scruffy, just like, do you know what I mean? Like a scruffy lad, not much about him. So quite dim is what they said about him. And he wasn't overly popular or anything like that. So you know, he wasn't very good at schoolwork. He apparently was all right at art and um, design and technology. But everything else, yeah, it wasn't for him. School was not the life of Fred. One of the claims that Fred made as well, that he cost, it was incest as well, rife in his family. Obviously, like, parents were abusing the kids. They were abusing each other. Fred stated that he thought he'd impregnated his own sister. I'm not sure if that's true, that's just what he had said. I've not got any backup on that. Maybe you can have a look, pop it in the comments below. So it wasn't all bad for Fred after that. I mean, it's terrible anyway, right? Because this guy's life is not going in the right direction. At 15, he leaves school, which um, he was actually illiterate, or well, virtually illiterate. He, le he left school and he got a job as a farmhand. He got slightly better looking, apparently, as time went on. And at the age of about 16, he became kind of attracted to some girls. And he was like, oh, I like this. All right, cool. However, pretty soon after, he was a victim of a horrific accident. 
he was on his motorcycle and he suffered a horrendous accident. He had um, severe injuries where he had some metal plate put on his head. One of his legs was permanently shorter than the other. Um, and if we're looking at biological factors of crime here, we've got somebody who's had something put into their head. Now, afterwards, reportedly, he got he had like violent outbursts and anger issues that he hadn't had before. So that's something we should try and factor in as well when we're looking at these crimes. So is there a biological factor here now he's had that injury? that might make it make him even more susceptible to committing these crimes. There's something happened that's turned off that rational behaviour switch. Let's continue our journey. Not long after he was out and he put his hand up a girl's skirt, the top of a fire escape, which is like, no thanks, and like pushed him. And quite rightly so, well done girl. And he fell down the stairs and hurt his head again. So that's double head injuries. So that's something for us to consider I'm not making an excuse for him, by the way. These are just facts that might help us formulate this picture. And so let's just recap up to the age we are at now then. So he's only in his late teens. He's born into a large family, which doesn't mean anything. His parents are abusive. That does mean something. He abuses animals. Does mean something again. And he's got some severe head injuries. Okay. That's where we are currently. Now, at 19 years old, Fred gets charged with molesting a 13-year-old girl and he gets ostracised from his family. Even they were like, no me. However, he didn't get sent to prison because of his epileptic seizures. So I don't know what that meant back in the olden days, but apparently it meant you don't have to go to prison for molesting kids. And he went to go and live with his sister. Time went on and he got a job in construction. So, you know, apparently he's quite good with his hands in terms of like the dexterity for design technology and art and stuff like that. So construction seems like a pretty good fit. However, he got fired for stealing. So. He'd already started getting done for like petty thefts and things like that. So these habits, he'd continued into his adult life. After he'd been caught stealing, he went and lived back home with his parents. He finally let him back in, in a place called Much Markle. And that was at the age of 21. I've never heard of Much Markle before, by the way, until I looked at this case. So yeah, he moved back to a place called Much Markle, where he was from with his family. When he got back home, he rekindled a romance with one of his previous girlfriends. Catherine Costello, also known as Rena. And yeah, that was it. It was like, oh yeah, this is great. And they moved really, really quickly. So um, she was also known as Rena, and she was actually pregnant with somebody else's child when they got together. But within two months, they'd hooked up together, they moved in and they got married. And to explain why the child bore no resemblance to Fred, he tried to, well, he did convince her. So we've got coercive control here. He did convince her to tell her parents she'd actually lost her child at childbirth and then adopted another one because this child was mixed race and Fred was a Caucasian, as was Catherine, so it didn't add up. But by claiming they'd adopted the child, they got out of any scrutiny for that or judgment because back then it wasn't the same as it is now in terms of, you know, single mothers and things like that. Um, and also Fred was controlling and peculiar. So when they got married, they moved to Scotland and that's where they stayed. And um, Catherine had a child, Charmaine, who we call Charmaine. And yeah, life seemed pretty sweet for a little while. However, uh, I say however a lot, don't I? Fred was really controlling in relation to sex. And un he had unusual tastes that Catherine didn't reciprocate. She didn't like it different to perhaps conventional methods on which couples um, engage in activity. Let's just leave that there. So she didn't really like it and there was fractions there in that relationship. She did however become pregnant in 1964 with their first biological child together Anne Marie, who was Anne Marie West and we'll talk about her a little bit later on because she is an excellent piece of this puzzle. So while in Scotland then Fred gets a job as an ice cream man. I mean would you buy an ice cream from this dude? It could be the hottest day in the year, right? And I would not buy an ice cream from that guy. But obviously I know he's Fred West. Maybe if I didn't know he was that guy, I would, but I don't really think I would. Anyway, yes, he turned into a job as an ice cream man. Unfortunately though, there was an actual accident this time where he killed somebody. He ran over a small, a small boy, four year old child and killed him. And after that, they moved back to England. It was just, they just moved back to England from Scotland to begin their life here. So there was Fred, there was um, Catherine, there were the two girls, so Charmaine and Anne-Marie, and also two of their friends moved down with them. There was Anna McFall and Isa McNeil. So Isa McNeil was a childminder 
Anna McFall was Rena's friend. Rena's occupation, by the way, it was apparently a, a thief, that occupation, and a sex worker. So that's what she did when she met Fred. So there's this underlying current of crime with, within this family. So that, that's normal in their in their lives. Having just suddenly turned to crime is something that's been within their lives for all of their lives, what they used to. It didn't take long when they were back in Gloucester for the relationship to actually end. And that's largely down to the fact that Fred was a massive sex pest and she wasn't interested. And the stuff he liked to do, she did not. I mean, if you're not compatible, guys, you are not compatible. Don't force it. You, know, you can't force a square peg into a round hole. Not sure that's the best analogy, but you know what I mean. Anyway, so, yeah, the marriage crumbled and um, Catherine's like, you know what, I'm going back to Scotland. This is not the life for me. And now she plops to Scotland. She does, however, leave the kids with Fred, which is unusual, given that a lot of the time when relationships end, the mother takes the children, but the children stayed with Fred. So whether they or not that's because he was so controlling, or uh, who knows, maybe he could say, yeah, you can go, but the kids stay with me. That kind of drama that you see on EastEnders all the time, or in real life. So yeah, off she goes to Scotland. It didn't take long for her to miss her daughters, and she's like, I'm coming home. So she gets home, what does she find? Fred has moved on. With her friend, Anna? Are you kidding me, Anna? Really? Of all the guys in England, you chose this guy. Okay, right. And not only that, she's moved on and impregnated her. This guy clearly does not understand contraception, right? So yeah, he moves on and he impregnates Anna. And she's like, I want you to divorce Catherine. With me now, prego, get rid. He took it the wrong way, clearly, because he didn't get rid of Catherine, he got rid of her. That's right, his first victim that we know of was none other than Anna McFall, the mother of his child. He killed her, he dismembered her, which means you cut him up and he buried her, number one. That's his first one. And it doesn't stop there. Oh no. A few months later, Catherine's like, it's just, it just isn't working. I'm off. And off she goes again. See ya. Yeah, she's gone now. That's it. She, she doesn't want anything to do with Fred. But this is not the last we hear of Catherine in our story. Please stay with us. And that was all in 1966. In 1968, a young girl went missing from a bus stop, never to be seen again. And that was, she was only 15 years old, Mary Baston. And that's the last time anyone ever saw her, never to be seen again. And this bus stop situation crops up throughout this history of our story. So please do. Keep that in mind, the bus stop and the young girl. So in yet another guise, Fred decides he wants to be a bakery driver. And that's what he does. He starts a job as a bakery driver. So what you get in the UK is these bread vans, right? Or we used to back in the olden days, where they turn up with baked goods on your road. A bit like an ice cream van, but with uh, more carbohydrates. You used to get pop men as well, who turned up with like fizzy drinks. It was so cool, apart from all the murders. So anyway, he decides he wants to be a bakery van driver, and that's where he meets Rosemary Letts. Rosemary Letts, um, who we now know as Rosemary West, was born in um, 1953. So she's 12 years younger than Fred. You know, that, that ain't no thing, you know. Age gap relationships do work. My parents have a 12 year age gap, and they are not serial killers to my knowledge. So Rose was 12 years younger than Fred. She married him when she was only like 19 though, so she's quite a lot younger in terms of maturity than Fred is. Now let's have a look at Rosemary's character then. So we've done all Fred's background. We know all about his childhood, his schooling, his injuries to his head. Um, the fact he's already started killing people, one by accident, two on purpose. We know that this guy is a bad egg. Enter Rosemary West. Now when I first started reading about this case, I was thinking, now I wonder if Rosemary had been coerced and controlled into these acts. And that stuck with me for quite a while until I dug a little bit deeper. I do wanna know what you think as well. And I've read like, you know, transcripts from interviews, things like that. And this character is unusual, which is why it's great for us to study these minds because to study them is to understand them. At least we hope so anyway. Rosemary, like Fred, had a terrible childhood. Terrible, terrible childhood. She was abused by her father. In fact, all of her family were abused by her father. He would rape her and her older sister and her mother. He was a, a terrible person. 
and he was schizophrenic so he had got mental health problems and that by the way is not a problem having mental health issues doesn't make you a serial killer or a bad person it's just a factor in relation to his behavior at the time and untreated conditions like schizophrenia can be quite um unsettling in a, in a family of course they can so anyway he's abusive to his children physically sexually mentally bad guy rose herself is no um She's not going to win any Nobel Peace Prizes or anything or any science prizes for her intellect. So at school they called her Dozy Rosie. She didn't have many friends again. And she was meant to, said to be not very intelligent among her peers. So she, she wasn't very well liked. She was bullied and stuff as well. And when she did get bullied by other people at school, she'd attack them physically. And we've got to bear in mind what she's used to at home. So if people speak out to others, maybe they get attacked physically at home. This is what we've got to consider when building these pictures. So she attacks people back physically. She's also kind of really sexually overt at home. So she starts walking about, parading about naked, especially in front of her younger brothers. She's, as soon as her body started developing, she got more like, oh, check me out. And sexual, sexually active. That's not unusual for children who are being sexually abused. So just bear that in mind. So that's that's definitely an indication of being sexually abused because her terminology, her language, her behaviours are very sexualised for a young person. That in itself is a clear indicator she has been sexually assaulted and groomed for, for a period of time potentially as well, which we know she did have. And yeah, so her mum, when Rose was 15, she like, her mum had had enough of the abuse. She took the kids and she went. Well, she took Rose and went to live with her older sister. But it was like that same year Rose moved back to her dad's house. Why? Why would you do that, Rose? Oh, it's all right us saying, like, I would never do that. But bearing in mind, she's probably been conditioned into this behaviour. And for some peculiar reason, she's gone back. And the incest continues. And her dad doesn't like dating um, people her age. And she starts getting involved with all the guys, romantically, or at least trying to forge some kind of relationships. Unfortunately, she was raped again at 15. So all this horrific stuff she's been through, it doesn't make excuses for behaviour, but it leads us to understand how some, some of the acts she did, which we'll go through, so disgusting, debauched or graphic, might not seem as bad to her, even though a rational person, or any other person, would think they were completely and utterly wrong, which they were. Not long after she moved back with her dad, she met the bakery driver. Fred West. And that brings us up to date to where we are. So prior to her meeting Fred, she'd not murdered anybody that we know of. Not yet, anyway. When these two get together, they hit it off. And like I said, these are a match made in hell. These guys are combined, doubly dangerous and bloody weird. And that's what happens as we start to unravel this story. So these guys get together, Rose and Fred. And they're very, very close, very, very quickly. Again, which is a telltale sign of Fred West gets in there, gets in there quickly. And that's what coercive controllers do. So if you're in an abusive relationship, they like love bomb you at first, like, oh, you're the best thing in the world. And you feel super lucky that they like you. You're like, oh, I can't believe how lucky I am. Oh. And then as soon as they've got you in that commitment, whatever that may look like, pregnancy, marriage, etc., living with them, um, then they become abusive. And it's very, very difficult to get out. I don't know if that happened here, but it's just something for us to consider. So she gets with Fred. Very quickly, again, they hook up. She's off to live with him. She gets pregnant. He's got two daughters already. So he's got Charmaine, remember, and Anne-Marie from earlier. And now he's with Rose and she falls pregnant. Fred, as we know, is a notorious criminal. And he's in and out of prison for theft and other stuff. He's a bad guy, right? You know, in terms of society, I don't know what he's really bringing to the table. He's taking a lot, uh, dishonestly appropriating a lot. And as such, he's in and out of prison, which leaves Rose to look after his two girls and their new baby, who they call Heather. Now, there's some speculation that Heather might actually be Rose's father's child with Rose, because, you know, it was all pretty weird back then in their relationship. But, you know, me, multiple sources say that Heather was Fred's. Some say Rose's father, Bill's. I don't know. I've not done any paternity tests on those. But what we do know is that there was a baby called Heather. So Rose didn't like the fact that he got other kids and she resented it actually. 
We're talking about proper evil stepmother. So wicked and evil that she actually kills Charmaine. So about eight years old, actually. So only a little girl, she kills her. And that was in 1971 when she killed Charmaine. Um, Charmaine's mum, who had not heard from her, Catherine Costello, came to look for her. Run, Catherine. Stay in Scotland, Catherine. So yeah, she turned up and um, never went back to Scotland. Nice. Well, that got rid of that problem, didn't it, Fred? So, yeah. So, both Charmaine and Catherine are missing. So, let's just remember those. Tick. We still have Anne-Marie, however, and Heather. So, we know that they are still around with Rose and with Fred. They were married in 1972. Blissful. And, um, you know, it became business as usual. And when I say business, let's get on to the business, actually, because Rose West had her own business working from home. In fact, she became a sex worker in her own house and she'd have a red light outside her, the door where she, room where she performed these services. And when it was on, the kids knew not to disturb her. So she was working from home um, in prostitution. And Fred not only was okay with this, he promoted it and like put advertisements in like mags or whatever. And he'd put like holes, peep holes, in the wall so we could watch so that like voyeurism gratification stuff and that was one of the things they did and i guess she was into the same stuff that he was into that Catherine was not into but yeah they seemed a pretty good match there i guess in june 1972 rose gave birth to another daughter may west not the actress may west but may west child of fred and rose west may west and realizing their current house was too small they moved into 25 cromwell street now, that address in itself is notorious amongst criminology and stuff, and you will find out why in this video and further reading, I'm sure. So 25 Cromwell Street, we're in, and we've got Anne-Marie, Charmaine is dead, Heather and Mae West. Rose continues her occupation. She's got quite a steady income, I imagine, and she has um, loads more of the kids anyway. She ends up having eight children of her own, plus Fred's. And of those children, five are said to be Fred's, one potentially a dad's, and three are of punters. And the, I think the reason why they knew they were punters is because they were of different ethnicities to Fred. So she got uh, mixed children and her punters were of mixed um, ethnicities too. I don't know who the fathers were. I'm not sure they do either. But anyway, she had lots of kids and they all lived in 25 Cromwell Street, which is not a massive house. And it was quite... Um, well, yeah, she was quite open about the fact that she was into prostitution and she was a sex worker. Whatever, whatever folks about. Nothing against sex workers, just a lot against serial killers. Anyway, going back to 1972, we've got, um, as we know, Anne-Marie, Heather and baby um, Mae West. I don't know why that means, baby Mae West. And they decided they need someone to help look after the kids, right? I mean, three children can be such hard work. Well, we had four, but we don't talk about that. They hired a nanny, Carolyn Owens. I mean, she wasn't a trained nanny. She was a teenager that they found hitchhiking. And, um, you know, they were giving it the whole, we're really caring parents and you're looking for a place to live, come stay with us. And if you look after our kids, you can live rent free. And she was like, all right, you seem like a nice couple. And couples aren't as scary as one lone stranger. So you see a couple and children, you think, oh, I'm safe here. Caroline, you're not safe, mate. Oh, no. Anyway, so Caroline Owens moves in and lives with them. They'd both made sexual advances towards her and she was like, mate, I'm really not bothered. And she ran off um, and she went to her boyfriend's house. They plotted, however, and caught her again. They found her and caught her again. And they were really nice to her. They're like, oh, we're so sorry about any miscommunication. You know, I promise it won't happen again. Please come back. Let's sort it out. And she's like, oh, all right then. And believes them. Whilst in the back of the car, Rose hops into the back for a girly chat, you know and uh, assaults her. So she fondles her, then um, she was attacked by Fred and they gag her, bind her, take her home and she's tortured for a long, long time and raped for a long, long time, all night probably. And she's drugged as well. You know, why not? Throw it all in. Come on guys, just go for it. And how, she did wake up and the only reason why she survived is because she agreed to be their childminder again. Yeah, I promise. Yeah, okay, it's fine. I was part of the family. And to prove this, she's kind of like doing chores and things. She's like, yeah, look, I'm part of the family. 
she legs it the day after. They go to a laundry and she's off. Thank God. She goes to her mum and her mum's like, you don't look well. Are you all right? And she breaks down and tells her everything. Mum goes to the police and, you know, they're arrested and questioned. And she's so upset about what happened and not wanting to go through it again. She drops it. Then they're charged £50 each for like indecent assault, but not for the horrible ordeal Caroline was put through. But the, it's important to remember that the trauma this young girl's gone through, especially in the 70s. I mean, they don't have the tools they have now to look after people, the trauma counsellors. And she just didn't want to live through it again. And you cannot blame her for that. And anyway, that's what happened. But she escaped. She lived. If it hadn't been for her agreeing to be a childminder again, she probably wouldn't have done. So lucky escape, kind of, Carolyn. This became a little bit of an MO for the Wests. So they'd meet these vulnerable, lonely girls who were hitchhiking or at bus stops looking lost on the streets. They'd offer them this lovely warm place to stay. And they could live in our house as long as you do a little bit of work for us. And they did. Some survived. Some did not. In fact, over the course of 20 years, this same behaviour claimed the lives of another. So remember, Fred's already killed two. Um, we know Rose has killed one. And there's at least 12 or 13 confirmed victims. So over the course of this next 20 years, the same kind of thing happens. So they target these usually Caucasian, lonely, young girls they befriend them so we're looking at the coercive control stuff they befriend them gain their trust they trap them they rape they torture sometimes they kill they dismember they bury the bodies one of the um victims was witness to something and she was there as a childminder and she managed to escape thank god she was uh, in bed at night and she heard one of the children crying saying stop daddy please stop and this child was heather now one thing that he'd said was that he would break in his own kin so he raped his own children at the age of about eight he'll break in his kids and yeah this was apparently heather's turn and the child mind heard this and left the day after and she didn't even give him time to be like plotting any weird shit she was like, oh, yeah, I I'm leaving. Like, oh, no, when? Yeah, now. And she's off. This child, Heather, as well, also tells school friends about what's happening. School friends tell their parents. Parents tell school. School tell the police. Heather's not believed. And um, to get away with that as well. Heather, however, does not. And not long after, no one ever sees Heather again. In fact, a family... Um, Something that all the children said in subsequent interviews later down the line was that they were always threatened with, you'll be under the patio like Heather. And they used to say something like three up and two across because the patio itself looked a little bit like a checkerboard or a chessboard. And that was the, the threat, the family threats. If you misbehave, you'll end up like Heather under the patio. Just remember that for later. So we know they have murdered in, at least, well, 12 to 13 people in this house, probably like nine. And this is where it happens. So we all know that the MO. So we know the young women who are lonely and scared and what happens to them. So they get gagged, raped, tortured, killed, dismembered, buried. This is their MO. And they're both involved with this. So he actually raped his own daughter, Anne-Marie, as well. So all of them, actually. Well, that was his tradition, remember. And he terminated... She had to terminate the pregnancy, sorry, because it was ectopic, which means it grows outside your fallopian, in your fallopian tube and um, can be really deadly if you don't terminate. And she escapes after that. She goes, so she is safe. So we know anne -Marie's fine. We know that Charmaine is dead. We know that Heather is dead. But we don't know about Anne-Marie. We know she's safe, okay? She, um, these killings continue, this same MO. And it's when May comes of age for a father's tradition that it all comes unfolded. So, uh, well, quite a while after, actually, May confides in her school friends about what's happening, about the abuse. They go to the parents, parents go to the police. This time, they listen. It comes to the attention of Hazel Savage, who is a, a police officer. And this officer does not believe Fred. And in fact, after May came forward, another victim came forward. They were arrested. So the children put into care, thankfully, um, so what was left of them anyway, they were put into care 
and they were arrested for the rape. The rape case, however, folded because the victims withdrew. Again, I mean, it's a disgusting ordeal to have to go through. And like I said, they haven't got the things they have now in terms of courts and, and protection for victims that they have had back then. I mean, back now it's so much better than it was in the 70s and 80s. So they're arrested and, you know, for this rape, but the charges get dropped and they walk again. Not for long, however. So Hazel Savage was not convinced there wasn't something wrong with these. And she wanted to know where Heather was. Where the hell is your child? Because she's not here, is she? Where's Heather? And they interviewed them. They spoke to Fred and to um, Rose. And you can find those interview transcripts online. So anyone can find them, have a look at them. Horrible stuff. And yeah, they interviewed him and they asked where Heather was. And they, they weren't happy. And they spoke to the kids as well. So after the, the rape, obviously, of May, they speak to the kids. And in those interviews, they're all talking about this patio threat. The parents say you end up under the patio. Hazel Savage gets a warrant to search the patio. Oh dear. Guess what she finds under the patio? Well, the officers started digging it up. Fred knew the jig was up. He coughed it. He's like, I killed her. She's under the patio. We'll find it ever under the patio. And they did. So when they're digging, one leg bone, two leg bone, three leg, three leg bones? Hang about. They present this evidence to Fred and he admits to further murders. They keep adding up, coming and coming and coming. And Savage is like, I'm still not satisfied actually. There's all these missing people in this area. The MO is the same. They disappeared from a bus stop. They were by themselves. Tell me about these people. What do you know? And she got a warrant for the house. And in the cellar, we find the rest of the victims so far that we know about. We don't know if there are others. We just know so far that's what she finds. Well, as you can imagine, they both get arrested for murder. And Fred in interviews like Rose had nothing to do with it. She didn't know anything about these murders. You know, not a thing. She was not involved. And Rose is like, I don't know anything about these murders. And in the interview about where, where is Heather, where's your child? She was like, well, I'm not seeing her yet. She just disappeared, left home. And it was really like blase, like, and she's very sweary. Like she really does not care that her daughter has vanished. And she makes all these mad excuses about, oh, I gave her this money and all this kind of stuff, which doesn't turn out to be true. Anyway, so she's, when they actually tell her that we found the body and Fred's admitted to killing her, she's like, what? And she seems like, is it she surprised that they found her? Is she surprised that Fred did it? Is she surprised that she's dead? Who knows? What we do know, however, is that Fred takes a rap for it. And she's like, eh, thanks, Fred. Unfortunately, Fred did talk. And Fred spoke to his, his appropriate adult. So an appropriate adult in police interviews and things like that. So this is in the 1990s. So this is post pace. Had this been found in the 70s, by the way, it wouldn't have had an appropriate adult. Just saying. So anyway, they got him this appropriate adult. And an appropriate adult is someone who facilitates the conversations in police interviews. And you can have those if you've got, um, if you don't have the mental capacity or for other reasons why you might not be able to communicate during an interview. And his appropriate adult and him, he became to trust her. And he actually said, you know, Rose killed two by herself and she was definitely involved in the others. Uh-oh. That witness proved valuable. And when in court, Rose was sentenced to life in prison the murders of 10 people. What about Fred then? Fred never actually made it to court because he killed himself in his cell in 1994. So he hung himself while he was incarcerated. But he was charged with 12 counts of murder, which he admitted. Rose, however, maintained her innocence. She's like, I didn't do it, guys. And she tried to appeal at first. And the appeal was not upheld. And this life imprisonment, um, I think it originally was like 25 years, that got turned into a whole life tariff. Now your whole life order, whole life tariff means that you will never, ever, ever get out of prison. No matter what, you'd never be eligible for parole because you are too risky to be out in the public. It doesn't matter how much rehabilitation or all the stuff you go through, you are never allowed back into the public world because you are too high risk. Look what you've done, right? You raped and tortured your own children. You murdered some of them. You attacked all these vulnerable young women. You're just not allowed on the streets anymore. Soz. 25 Cromwell Street was demolished in 1996. I mean, no one's going to buy that, are they? Come on. And Fred did actually admit that he or said he killed more than the, the, what they counted. And who knows, some of these 
old um, Jane Doe's, as they call them, people they uncover. Maybe some kind of forensic links can be made now if they start working on those. I know there's certainly something they knew a few years ago looking for somebody under a cafe where Rose worked. I don't know what happened with that one. Let me know in the comments. What happened to Rose then? So we know Fred's dead. Rose, however, is still alive and kicking and she is in a West Yorkshire prison right now. Rose struck up a friendship in prison. Rose made a friend in Myra Hindley. So Myra Hindley was the first woman ever given a whole life tariff. Rose was the second. And Rose and Myra became buds, more than friends actually. They started a romantic relationship. Apparently Rose totally like hero worshiped Myra for a long time. And then they became rivals because they want to be like the top dog of the prison or whatever. And anyway, yeah, they had a romantic relationship together. And now Myra Hindley and um, Ian Brady were another famous, infamous couple who terrorized England with the crimes that they committed. So yeah, Rose and Myra hit it off in prison, had a love affair, and Myra died in 2002. Um, but Rose is still alive, still in prison. She decided not to appeal again, and she quite likes it where she is. Thank you very much. So yeah, that is the end of that one. So let's have a look at the forensic psychology stuff then. Or let's have a look at what's happening in the criminological world. We know that both of these offenders had terrible childhoods, abusive childhoods, and different like, views about what's normal, or normal in terms of sexuality. They deviate from society's norms, both of them. Individually, they are um, susceptible to crime. Together, it's an absolute combustion of crime. We know that there's domestic violence as well in, in the home. So Rose was very violent towards the children. She would hit them if they did things wrong. She would slash them with knives and things. They abuse their own kids. This was a bad, bad situation. We know that Fred's got biological issues also. We know he's been, he had two serious head injuries, which resulted in him having a metal plate in his head. Could that have been a factor for his rational choice? You know, um, why was Rose like she was? Was she reacting to her children, how she was t taught to react by her family? We don't know these things. This is what it's all about. In terms of the crimes themselves, the murders, they are very planned, very organised, very methodical. You couldn't tell. Apparently the house was super clinical, which for those times was like kind of weird because houses in like 70s, 80s and stuff were kind of cluttered, just full of chintzy crap. Probably a lot like my <laughs> shelves, to be fair. And um, her house was very clinical, very clean. And, you know, there wasn't any complaints about, oh, man, it stinks in here, like with Nilsson's house, right? So they were very methodical in how they committed these offences. I mean, what um, Fred West did, which is rather stupid of him, was he filmed himself actually attacking one of his kids, like raping her. And the detectives saw that. Nice. Um, yeah, so that was uncovered. And... It was honestly just, you can see, so if you really want to, because you see images and stuff online, I'm not going to put them in here because it's disgusting. But yeah, so we know there's all this stuff going on. The evidence is they find the bodies. Um, there's a specific way in which the bodies are treated as well. So the digits, fingers, toes, chopped off, sometimes kneecaps, um, sometimes decapitated. And yeah, and onwards. So that's how it happens. That's the, the MO. That's what we're looking at. In terms of evidence to convict, we've got confessions. We have the children's testimonies. They never actually saw any of the murders, apparently, but they did. Um, there were witnesses to what happened to them. And they had that threat all the time about their old sister being under the patio, and that's where they were going to go. So, come on. They, um, yeah, we had, obviously, all the witness testimonies about what they tried to do to them. We had the confession evidence, which is good. And, obviously, we had the bodies. There you go. That's what we had. Like I said, Rose maintains her innocence, but I think the evidence leans completely against that. And she's got a whole life tariff, so you don't need to worry about her creeping into your house in the middle of the night, guys. She's going to be there for the rest of her life. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. Please let me know in any comments um, below. And yeah, look after yourselves, look after each other, and please don't commit any crimes.